Welcome to the Stronger After Stroke podcast. I'm your host, Rosa Hart. I'm the stroke nurse navigator for Norton Healthcare. Dr. Brian Davis, a licensed clinical psychologist who specializes in health psychology, is my special guest today. Now, you came here to Norton Healthcare from the Cleveland Clinic, where you completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the Mellon Center for MS. Mm -hmm. You recently joined the Norton Neuroscience Institute and lead the behavioral medicine team, and we're expanding that needed emotional support for patients who are managing life with MS and other neurological conditions. So for our conversation about stroke, um, I, because of your previous dissertation work, um, you were studying the social construct of masculinity and its differential expression in culturally culturally different populations using a mixed method approach. That sounds really complicated. <laughs> what does yes. that mean? Yeah, so that was actually my dissertation research. So my, my focus looking at gender norms um, and the social construction of gender norms on our behavior it goes back to, you know, the end of my doctorate training. Um, you know, I found it very powerful in terms of how we perform, how we act in our day to day is often uh, a term I like is this invisible hand that kind of guides us through our day and showing us how to behave. Um, male, female, that can look a little bit different, but it's based on the same social constructs and how we ought to uh, behave in society. Um, as I got into health psychology and working within neurology, I realized that focusing on gender, focusing on the variables that I just spoke to isn't really looked at. Um, and I think uh, specifically within neurological conditions, MS being one of them, the prevalent rates of MS in male to female is not even. So, um, you know, looking and kind of focusing on masculinity and the norms there and some of the difficulty men can have in terms of dealing with the chronic condition um, and looking at some of those social norms and social constructs that limit behavior, limit emotionality um, that plays a role in how men cope um, and can add a layer of, of difficulty that no one's really talking about. Um, so in being here, it's been really great because, you know, beyond MS, you know, I'm able to look within different specialties, um, stroke being one of them. And, and it's, it's a common theme where, where we're seeing here are individuals that are trying to manage a, a new chronic condition that's been thrust upon them um, that often interferes with their identity, often interferes with uh, what they're used to in terms of going about their day, uh, being a family member, being a worker, uh, being a person. It can look different. Uh, and that is a level of strain that, again, is normal, uh, is there, that is prevalent. Um, and we have to start talking about these things to provide the the care for these people and patients that uh, are dealing with this on a daily basis. So yeah, that's where my kind of past interest before health, I was just interested in this area. And then as I got deeper and deeper into the medical setting and different health specialties, you, you just see, you know, some of the some of the same areas that you're concerned with. Um, just on a general level, now being in the specific areas, um, well, we see different for men out. who may feel less uh, able to express themselves with their words to sure. talk about how they're feeling. Um, my patients who have aphasia and their speech is impacted may not be able to physically communicate these ideas that they may be struggling with internally. So I want to be able to open up that conversation for both people who've had a stroke as well as their care partners to think about how do you feel after having a stroke and you are not able to do the things that you found your identity in before such as in the instance of a man, if you're the provider for your household and then you have a stroke and you're then dependent on others to provide for you, that's a huge shift. And for say a woman who's a primary caregiver, like the mother or the matriarch of the family sure. and doing for everybody else. And then all of a sudden 
you're the one who needs help. Sure. And so for those people who have a huge role shift after a new diagnosis or a new stroke, um, I think this is an important conversation to have about how do we find our identity if we're no longer able to um, really step into those old established roles we had. Yeah, because I think every a lot of what you said was the new way is in contradiction to the old way. And I think when I think of social norms and social constructs and and when, when I say that, I'm basically saying, how, how have we learned to be? Um, it becomes very rigid and it's often rigid normally because we are not thrusted into having to change it throughout our life. So um, this comes in different ways, but being diagnosed with a chronic condition is one of them. You know, what we're basically asking the person to do is, hey, become very flexible in how you look at yourself all of a sudden, while you're also trying to, you know. Uh, relearn how to speak or exactly. relearn how to it, walk. It, and, and it's a big ask. So to your point, just asking that question, mm -hmm. I think is a question that no one's really asking them. So, you know, if we're having a conversation with a family, with a patient and their, and their, and their partner, their sister, their, their, their family member, whoever that be, just the fact that you're opening the door for that to be an idea that, hey, this person might, that's another layer that we, we, we weren't thinking of, their providers aren't necessarily asking about. Um, so just that alone, I think, just the opening and what we're doing here, just opening this conversation and saying, hey, this is a, this is a relatively normal strain that we're talking about that, that, that comes with this. And we're happy to talk about it and, and to and to be on the front end of this. Uh, and it's normal to have this as part of the human experience. Absolutely. So if you're feeling this way, you're not alone. And there and, and we're not the first people to have this conversation. Um, but we definitely want to create a space to invite more people to talk about it. Absolutely. So um Let's explore how we are socialized for our gender roles. Sure. I think you, you kind of touched on it. You know, it, it, I tend to focus more on the masculine side. It's where a lot of my research has been, you know, so I, I like to think of it as, it, it, in the research, what we phrase it as is traditional masculine, masculinity ideology. So it's a fancy term for, for saying, you know, kind of the gender norms and, and being a male. So in Western society, what does that look like? A lot of that looks like emotion, you know, emotional restriction, independency, toughness, whether that's through physical toughness or emotional toughness, um, you know, being a provider. In uh, all these things, they, don't get me wrong when I say these, these traditional things, they're not inherently bad things, right? So, so th this is what this country has been built on. It's a lot of strong, independent people. Um, and that's, that's not a bad thing. Where, where we get into with this is where we, where we get rigid in how we perform those. So with my history looking at men, I think we see this where men don't show up to their appointments as often. Men don't seek therapy as often. Um, men don't speak about their emotions as often. Well, we tend to suppress more because that's kind of what we're taught to do. We're taught mm -hmm. to suck it up. We're taught to figure it out. We're taught to fix it. Um, and if, if, we, if we don't do that, it's met with environmental consequences, right? So From might, other people. It might be ridicule. It might be, you know, your partner second guessing your abilities. Um, you know, it could be work or coworkers, um, judging you differently. So, so there's a cost of doing different. There's a cost of not being rigid in, in society. Um, so looking at that again, when, when we have a chronic condition that kind of forces us to be flexible in that rigid way of being, um, what we're basically just looking at and asking is, is how else can we perform these very meaningful things in our lives? Mm -hmm. um, and that's what we help with in terms of the behavioral medicine team is we're interested in what's meaningful for that person, what role is meaningful, and how can we still do that, although we can allow it to look different? 
And I think that from a, from a male side to a female side, you know, we can look at them as a mirrored image of, of gender roles. I think you, you brought up a lot from a female side of, of, you know, being the main caregiver, you know, being independent as well. And how many times do those female caregivers prioritize other people's needs over their own and feel like 100%. I have to suck it up and grin and bear it mm-hmm. or grit my teeth and get through it because yeah. all these people are depending on sure. me. How else are these kids going to eat? Right. right. And and then it flips into, okay, now I'm dependent on others mm-hmm. for the first time, maybe ever. And they're not used to asking for help and they're, um, they're not used to it. Their, their, their environment isn't used to it. So it, also too, we're talking about the individual person, but this mm-hmm. also works within a system. So, you know, when, when that shift happens within a family, I mean, it's, it's not just the individual dealing with the diagnosis, it's the partner, it's the kids, it's, it's the, mm-hmm. it's, I like to call it the ecosystem that we've built as a family of all of them that, that shifts. I mean, that's, there's a lot that comes with this. So people who are used to being taken care of no sure. longer can look to that person sure. they have to do for that person yeah. and so it it you know these these gender norms you know it, it's a lot of i like to look at it from you know the 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 societal norms in in this country thrust upon male and females i think we all know those we all feel those we're used to those um and again when you know life isn't coming at us and when things are good our rigidity towards those aspects aren't exactly tested and we don't need to really think about them you know we wake up we go to work we get the paycheck we come home and eat dinner with the family you know we we do this we do this we do this and we don't have to think about all the all the things that we do in specific ways until something happens and then when something happens it appropriately and will rattle everything that we're used to. Um, so it too, in, in gaining flexibility and in, in how life works, that's really what we're aiming at because we don't really want to get in the conversation of, of either or, right? And then when I meet with a lot of patients, what a topic often is, is what I used to do. Mm-hmm. And I can't do this anymore. And that rigidity is kind of back to that. And you think about society is pretty dichotomous, on, off, left, right, up, down, hot, cold, black, white. I mean, everything is kind of in that. There's not a lot of in-between here. So what we tend to explore is, well, what's that in-between? So if it's, if it's not necessarily um, either or, you know, what's, what's that gray between the black and white? And that's where our conversations lead. So it's back to that idea of what values matter for that individual person, which is going to be different. So an example of that, whether it's male or female, let's think of it as providing for the family. Mm-hmm. So maybe for one person that might be, hey, providing was financial mm-hmm. and now I can't work anymore. So that was the one way I provided. Um, for another, it might be more emotional. I provide care and emotionality for my family. Mm -hmm. And now that's challenged now. So we revolve around what the word provider means for that person. And then how can we flexibly define that role? And how can we still do that? Although it looks different, Mm -hmm. how can we still perform that? Because that really matters for that person. And it's not this either or. And, And they could be right. Maybe they can't do it the same way that they used to do it, but they can still do it in a way that, although it looks different, can be habituated and can be practiced. And, and, and again, from an identity standpoint, um, it, it brings the idea of the book Identity Theft. Um, that book, written by a uh, the, the author, had a stroke. Mm-hmm. And was a professor at Stanford and was used to being very academic and, and having all of these capabilities and abilities and, and it's public speaking and hundred percent and and what I found so remarkable about reading that book was this book is a microcosm for what we're talking about. Yeah. So she wrote that book. She had help writing that book. Mm-hmm. But her value is teaching others. 
Yeah, but after her stroke, she had aphasia and was no longer able to speak and keep her job as a professor. Exactly. So, so her life changed mm -hmm. drastically, but the value stayed the same. Mm -hmm. So the value of teaching and helping others mm -hmm. before the stroke looked like this. Post-stroke, it's in the form of writing a book. It's in the form of doing what she can in that same value that although looks different is still a part of her and that she's able to practice and fits more back with how she identifies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like that is a just great example of how someone can turn their value as a person into just a different expression. Sure. And so a lot of people can look for ways to do that. And I think just thinking of it from the perspective of I'm not the only person going through this because when you're stuck in your own head, it's really easy to feel isolated and alone and th assume that people are thinking things about you. Like if you're not able to fulfill those roles, maybe feeling like uh, your family's dissatisfied with you and you're afraid to ask, sure. but maybe having those honest conversations with your care partners of how are you feeling about this? Right. Because it's a group process like you were talking about yes. it everyone is affected and it's, no it's, one's life is the same it's a lot of interactions mm -hmm. and, and, a, and a lot of what we've been talking about requires interactions and you know from a <clears throat> a lot of the the support groups individual therapy facilitating communication within your family and all those things can happen at once mm -hmm. and and, and all those things can be participated in too, not back to this either or, you either do individual, or you do group, or you talk to your family yourself. You know, the, the idea is when, if a, if a person can meet a group of people that are is going through a similar experience, the validation in itself on just that. Mm -hmm. That's why a lot of group, support groups work mm -hmm. purely from the validation piece in your yeah. point, where someone goes, oh, I'm not the only person in the entire world that's going through this. Um, and, and you mix that with, with some individual work, building skills, you know, helping people re-engage in value-based behaviors, mm -hmm. you know, th this is where we see a lot of progress. And again, that's back mm -hmm. to that flexibility, I like to say, and allowing ourselves to do different and have things look different doesn't mean things are all or nothing or yes or no. Mm -hmm. So um, I think one of the terms you like to use is resiliency. Along with that, um, we want to be able to be present, to open up, to do what matters. So what are some ways that people can collaborate with their community to, uh, to find new opportunities to express themselves, would you say? Yeah, I think I'm a firm believer in, in the things that people have done, uh, whether that be through through work or through hobbies or through social support, we're really not asking them to do things drastically different. Really the resiliency is, is, is to leaning in to continue to participate in things in a, in a, in a more flexible way. Um, within their own mind. Within their own mind, 100%. So this is going to be subjective from person to person. So it isn't this standardized approach of everyone just do this one thing. Um, it's really for the person. That's really where, what we want to get to know too is, you know, what will increase vitality for, for you, which might look different from, from you and you mm -hmm. and you. Because um, it's not about the activity. It's about the mindset. Exactly. I think mm -hmm. a, a lot of research has come out from this idea of perception and how much that that matters and that's a very subjective experience. So um, you mean one person's perspective of themselves? Exactly. So an example would be how we look at social support. So we used to think that quantity was better. So if you have a hundred friends, that person's gonna feel supported. And really what we found was number doesn't matter. It's about perceived support. So that person can have one or two members of their support team compared to 100 and feel more supported than someone that has 100 doesn't feel connected to really anybody. Yeah. So I bring that up because I think what's going to be helpful for that person, we're interested in their own uh, perceived response to that. Um, 
and in terms of working and again keeping them leaned in rather than leaning away from from life from family from social activities hobbies um keeping them in with what they've always enjoyed so do you have something you would um use to talk someone through that like to identify the people they feel most supported by and focus on that exactly what i i'm i'm a visual person so what i what i like to do is write things out draw things out and and i like to from a value perspective i like to figure out what the person will what matters to them mm-hmm. and that might be broadly speaking family outdoor activities providing okay so how can we work together to practice this? So, so in the past, providing looked like Monday through Friday job, 12 hours a day. Okay, so how else can we provide for the family? Um, well, maybe being around more is actually, you're actually providing more connection, social support, um, love, building relationships. I mean, that's still provision. You're mm-hmm. still providing. Um, and how many times do we hear from people, my dad was at work all the time, right, we n- right. never saw him. So right. I never was provided with that opportunity to emotionally connect. And exactly. So, so you have so that time now. It's that flexibility around that word. That's a perfect, mm-hmm. ex- perfect example. And outdoor activities. It's like, well, I, I used to run 5Ks and I used to be outside and garden all the time. I used to, so what we're looking for is, okay, so those aspects, let's, let's, let's focus on those and how can we, how can we make those look different, but still there? So this might be, you know, sitting on the porch instead of doing the active gardening. It can be, mm-hmm. you know, spending time with their partner outside in some way. It can be being as active as they can be. Maybe if they're not able to run the five Ks or run the marathon, maybe it's, it's taking a walk, you know, if, if it's, you know, so it, it's around that idea of, again, getting away from this all or nothing. Mm-hmm. Well, I used to do this, but I can't do that anymore. So I might as well just stay inside and do the thing. So it, it's a really challenging kind. Of, and again, back mm-hmm. to that resilience piece, that's the resiliency. It's, just, it's the individuals allowing themselves to do different. And anytime we do different, there's there is a transition cost. It's, yeah. it's, it's draining. It's stressful. It's and, and, and you have to we, build new neural networks and we anticipate that. So, and we normalize <laughs> yeah. that. So if you're yeah. do, doing this thing, you're like, well, this is hard. This is, this is difficult. This is stressful. We're going, that, that kind of means you're doing it. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I tend to tell people if, if at the beginning here, if it's uncomfortable, that, that, that means you're doing it and it gets easier with time and, and our bodies get more used to that. And, and things can't be better if they stay the same, right? Well and said. Change is necessary in order to make progress. Exactly. So the more you do it, the easier it'll get. And sure. then you'll have a new routine and new habits to and, support you. And, you know, making sure the person is in isolation, trying to do all this new stuff mm-hmm. and trying to make all these changes. And, you know, so that, that team you have around you, or that's family, or that, that's a support group, or that's a therapist, or that's, that's a counselor of some kind, that's, that's that network that we want to build. Mm-hmm. Um, to help this person, you know, get back and get back to life. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to meet with me today, Dr. Davis. I feel like this is a very important message and thank you for teaming up with me to let people know that their experience in their own mind is not something they're alone in. Absolutely. Thank you.